The DOT has established nine different classes of hazardous materials. Class 1, explosives. Class 2, gases. Class 3, flammable liquids. Class 4, flammable solids. Class 5, oxidizers. Class 6, toxic materials. Class 7, radioactive materials. Class 8, corrosive materials. And Class 9, miscellaneous dangerous goods. Hazard classes may be further divided into divisions. For example, under hazard class 2, compressed gases, you will find 2.1 for flammable gases, such as acetylene, propane, and spray paint, 2.2 for those compressed gases that are not division 2.1 or 2.3, and 2.3, which are poisonous gases. Another term you're going to come across is ORMD, which is a marking for shipping packages in the United States identifying other regulated materials for domestic transport only. Packages bearing this mark contain hazardous materials in a limited quantity, presenting a limited hazard during transportation due to its form, quantity, and packaging. Some people mistakenly assume that ORMD marking indicates that the material is not regulated for transport. Actually, ORMD is a hazard classification, just like flammable liquids, corrosives, or radioactive materials. Another term you may hear often is limited quantities. All materials which meet the criteria of one of the nine DOT hazard classes are regulated as hazardous materials for transport. However, when the amount of certain hazardous material packed within a package is limited, the magnitude of the hazard is reduced but not eliminated. Thus, exceptions can be applied for packaging and hazard communication as authorized for certain hazard classes. If there's an opportunity to take an exception, either limited quantity or RMD, we will do so and provide the proper information into the shipping system. In addition to DOT markings, you will usually find other labels on containers such as those required by OSHA under the Hazard Communication Standard. As previously mentioned, OSHA has adopted the Global Harmonized System of Hazard Communication to standardize the look and information on labels, regardless of the country of origin. GHS labels provide much more information compared to the DOT label, which lists only the primary hazard. GHS labels must follow the same format as in the example shown here, although some will have more information than others, depending upon the number of hazards and precautionary statements that may be needed. The example shown here lists the basic parts of a GHS compliant label. Item one is the product identifier. This should match the product identifier on the safety data sheet. Item two is a signal word. It'll either use the word danger, meaning a severe hazard, or a warning, which is less severe. Item three are hazard statements. This is a phrase or phrases assigned to a hazard class that describes the nature of the product's hazards. Item four represents precautionary statements. This describes recommended measures to minimize or prevent adverse effects resulting from exposure. Item five is supplier identification. This lists the name, address, and telephone number of the manufacturer or supplier. And finally, item six are pictograms. These are graphical symbols intended to convey specific hazard information visually. Although there are nine DOT hazard classes, there are actually only three hazard classes generally encountered at Fleet Pride, corrosives, flammable liquids, and gases. There are also many products that are classified as ORMD, or limited quantity, that may contain these same hazards, but to a lesser degree, allowing Fleet Pride to take advantage of shipping exceptions. Corrosives are materials that can attack and chemically destroy exposed body tissue. Corrosives can also damage or even destroy metal. They begin to cause damage as soon as they touch the skin, eyes, respiratory tract, digestive tract, or metal. Example products which contain corrosives include truck and trailer washes, as well as battery electrolyte, which is sulfuric acid. Most corrosives are either acids or bases. Common acids include hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, and hydrofluoric acid. Common bases include ammonium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and sodium hydroxide. An important consideration is making sure emergency showers and eye wash stations are located close to where corrosives are used, stored, or handled in case of accidents. There are many products sold or used by Fleet Pride that are considered flammable liquids. Flammable liquids is a case where the definition differs between OSHA and DOT. The OSHA definition of flammable liquid is any liquid having a flash point below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. For DOT, a class 3 liquid means any liquid having a flash point of not more than 140 degrees. Flash point is the temperature of a liquid that produces enough vapor at the surface to flash in the presence of an ignition source. 
What is interesting is that the liquid does not actually burn, it is the vapor coming off the surface that does. Simply put, the lower the flash point, the easier it is for the liquid to ignite. If the flash point is below room temperature or ambient temperature, it is already at a point where it can become easily ignited. A combustible liquid is generally any ignitable liquid with a flash point high enough so that it doesn't qualify as a flammable liquid. If you see the symbol for flammable liquid, you should always assume that a spill is capable of being ignited at any time, should there be any ignition source close by, such as a running forklift or electric spark, including static electricity. The DOT label or placard will always be a red diamond with the symbol of a flame and the number three at the bottom for the hazard class. It may or may not have the words flammable or flammable liquid. The GHS pictogram is a white diamond with red border with a similar symbol of a flame. Gases, or DOT Hazard Class II materials, are defined as materials that exert, in the packaging, an absolute pressure of 43.8 psi or greater at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, or are a liquefied gas or a cryogenic liquid that do not meet the definition of Division 2.1 or 2.3. All compressed gases are hazardous because of the high potential pressures inside the cylinder or can. Gas can be released deliberately by opening a cylinder valve or accidentally from a broken or leaking valve or from a safety pressure relief device. Even at relatively low pressure, gas can flow rapidly from an open or leaking cylinder. Some aerosol cans contain flammable liquids and may have a flammable gas as a propellant. When these cans are exposed to fire or high heat, the liquids inside can expand, increasing the pressure, causing the container to rupture. Exploding cans can rocket, spreading ignited flammables great distances. It is therefore important to handle cases containing aerosol products carefully, making sure they are protected from accidental physical damage, are kept away from heat sources, and that the orientation arrows are always pointing upwards. There are three main divisions within Hazard Class 2. Division 2.1 is a flammable gas, depicted by a red label with the flame symbol and the number 2 at the bottom with the words flammable gas. Division 2.2 represents non-flammable, non-toxic gas, depicted by a green placard with the symbol of a compressed gas cylinder and the number two at the bottom indicating the hazard class. It may also have the words non-flammable gas. Division 2.3 represents toxic gas, depicted by a white placard with the skull and crossbones symbol with the number two at the bottom. The label or placard may or may not have the words poison gas. Fleet Pride employees are on the front lines every day, playing an important role in identifying problems and taking steps to prevent accidents involving hazardous materials. Some examples of things everyone should be looking for? Materials stored loosely or improperly placed on shelving that are in danger of falling. Liquid products stored in the wrong orientation, in other words, orientation arrows not pointing upward. Leaking containers, obviously damaged containers where their integrity may be in question, Materials that were dropped or mishandled and placed back into inventory without careful inspection. Containers where labels have been damaged or defaced, or containers of potentially hazardous materials where labels may be missing. Storage of incompatible hazardous materials right next to each other. Hazardous materials improperly placed on mezzanine levels or in upper tiers of pallet racking or shelving. And products removed and placed into the wrong packaging. Safety data sheets are available for every hazardous material or product that Fleet Pride carries, and every employee has a right of easy access to them. There are 16 different sections on a safety data sheet. The first is identification. It's very important that the safety data sheet matches up with the label on the product name that's on the container. Obviously, a safety data sheet is of no value if you're looking at the wrong material. So the most important part of a safety data sheet, the first section is identification, to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. The second section is hazard identification. This is a summary of the different hazards that are created or presented by this particular material. The third section provides information on composition of the products or the different chemicals within a product. In many cases, a hazardous material is not just one material, it's a combination or a mixture of many. And in this section, it identifies what all the constituent chemicals may be in this particular product. The fourth section covers first aid. These are emergency procedures to follow if people are accidentally exposed to a chemical or material. Section 5 provides information on how to fight fires involving that particular chemical or material. In some cases, it may suggest that you don't attempt to fight fires of these materials because some materials are water reactive, for example, and just putting water on them can cause an explosion or chemical reaction. Section 6 covers accidental release measures. How to handle material that might have escaped its container or might be leaking. 
There's some important things that you need to know and how to properly contain hazardous materials, including those that you should never attempt to handle yourself. Section seven involves handling and storage. This gives you very specific direction on what chemicals should not be stored together and how to safely store chemicals. It could also include special considerations like temperature extremes. Some chemicals may not be stored in direct sunlight. So how you handle and store materials is important. This part of the safety data sheet provides guidance in that area. Section eight covers exposure controls and personal protective equipment. OSHA has established permissible exposure limits, which are safe concentrations that you may be exposed to. In some cases, personal protective equipment may be necessary, such as respirators, eye protection, face shields, gloves, and a combination of them. Section nine involves physical and chemical properties. This is principally the information that safety engineers will use to determine safe handling procedures for you. But that information is there in case you're interested. Section 10 covers stability and reactivity. Some chemicals are highly reactive or unstable in certain situations. Section 11 is toxicological information. This is information on the toxic properties of the chemicals and, and how you could become exposed. What are the routes of entry? It could be inhalation or respiration. It could be ingestion or it could actually be absorption through the skin. This section also lists signs and symptoms of overexposure, which is very important so you can understand that you might be exposed to a particular material. Section 12 is ecological information. This is what harm could be done to the environment, and so the steps you might need to take in the event of an accidental spill or release. Section 13 is disposal considerations. It's very important when these materials spill, they may become hazardous waste, so they can't just be thrown down the drain or in the trash. Section 14 is transportation information, which is the DOT information we're going to be talking about later. Section 15 is regulatory information. This lists all the agencies that regulate this particular hazardous material. Section 16 is other information. This provides the vendor or supplier the opportunity to provide additional information on the properties or safe handling of this particular material. I know we've gone over a lot of material and information, but to put your mind at ease, we've already done a lot of work to make things easier for you to help you identify and safely handle hazardous material. New products or materials, when introduced to Fleet Pride, are first reviewed by the Environmental Health and Safety Department to determine the type of hazards they present and to develop special handling procedures when necessary. We ensure that up-to-date safety data sheets are obtained from manufacturers and suppliers and that they are accurate and complete. We determine which products are DOT regulated and take advantage of available shipping exceptions to make your job easier. We enter all necessary information into the shipping system so that accurate and complete hazmat shipping papers can be printed when needed. But with all this upfront activity, there is still a need for our employees to be on the lookout for potential problems. This can include labeling errors. For example, some manufacturers or suppliers may be using incorrect labels or markings. While you're not going to be asked to make decisions on exceptions, it's very important for you to understand what they mean. We have already seen why it's important to place hazardous materials in specified packaging to prevent accidental spills and releases, but there's a limit to the amount of abuse they can take. It is equally important that proper thought and care be put into the handling, movement, loading, and securing of hazardous materials onto trailers and other delivery vehicles. In addition to increasing potential for accidental spills, improperly secured loads can create a number of hazards, such as objects falling off the truck, causing other vehicles to become involved in an accident, objects coming loose and leaving the truck, striking and causing damage to other vehicles, sudden shifting or movement of loads, causing instability, which can result in the driver losing control of the vehicle, and sudden shifting or movement of cargo, which can cause injury to the driver or damage to the vehicle. During transportation, cargo must be restrained to prevent unacceptable movement during all foreseeable conditions of operation, including hard braking, sudden swerving, impact collision, windy weather, and rough roads. All employees responsible for moving and loading cargo must be trained, qualified, and authorized to use material handling equipment in powered industrial vehicles such as forklifts, ensure that all necessary load restraint equipment is available, has been properly inspected, and is in good condition. Understand and follow load restraint guidelines as outlined in Fleet Pride Procedure EHS 301 covering load restraint. There are many options available to secure cargo, including use of cargo bars, cargo nets, and ratchet straps. Proper stacking and shrink wrapping of pallets will help objects from coming loose or toppling during transit. And remember, always perform a pre-trip inspection to make sure the vehicle is in good condition and that all cargo is properly secured before leaving the dock.